This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University, and today I want to talk about Bitcoin's privacy problem. There have been a number of you who have requested this video. Please address Edward Snowden's talk at the Bitcoin conference. He said that without privacy at the base layer, Bitcoin is doomed. I completely disagree, but would love to hear what you think. That was from What's Good 22022. I will link to the relevant keynote speech. This was from the Nashville Bitcoin conference from this summer when Edward Stone spoke remotely from Russia, where he lives now. Before we discuss Bitcoin and privacy, though, some great quotes from the Snowden keynote, quote, cast a vote, but don't join a cult, obviously talking about the 2024 elections. Politicians are not our tribe. They are not your personality. They have their own interests, their own values, their own things they're chasing. I think he's referring to RFK Jr. and Trump and other politicians who came to the conference trying to appeal to Bitcoiners. Try to get what you need from them, but don't give yourself to them, even if you have to vote for them. That was the first quote that I really jumped out at me. The second quote, quote, as far as the average worker is concerned, whether we're talking about this election or any other in the last 20 years, a given election tends to result in what feels like a different uniform on the same cop. So I thought those are both quotes worth paying attention to. Now to return to the privacy question, privacy is a huge issue in the 21st century. It's not just a problem that Bitcoin has. In fact, every area of our lives is being surveilled now. It doesn't help that most people spend most of their waking hours online now, which is a very easy area to surveil, or that they carry spy devices, smartphones in their pockets everywhere, or that they install spy devices everywhere in their homes, like Alexa products, Siri, Ring doorbells, etc. So this isn't just a problem that Bitcoin has. Every fiat financial transaction is also being surveilled these days. And you can just imagine how much you could learn about someone's life and their preferences by viewing just a single monthly credit card statement. Privacy was a primary concern of the whole cypherpunk movement, which is the movement which really culminated with Satoshi discovering Bitcoin. But we can see this emphasis on privacy as early as the 90s from Eric Hughes, his cypherpunks manifesto. If you do a search for the word privacy, you can see how many times it shows up. I'll just read the first paragraph here. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one doesn't want the whole world to know, but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. And then most importantly here, privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. This should be your choice. You should not be unmasked or publicized by big tech or governments. Now, Bitcoin's base layer transactions, to turn this over to Bitcoin, Bitcoin's base layer transactions are pseudonymous, but not anonymous. Because of this, it's possible to use Bitcoin in a really, really private way. It's also possible to use Bitcoin in a way that leaks all of your privacy. For example, when you buy Bitcoin from a KYC exchange like Coinbase or Kraken or any of these, KYC stands for Know Your Customer. When you buy Bitcoin from a KYC exchange, you're forced to give them a lot of personal information, especially in 2024, your name, your home address, if you're in the US, your social security number, probably a photo of your driver's license and a matching selfie or some facial scan. And then this personal information is then associated with the Bitcoin address that you use to withdraw your Bitcoin from the exchange. Your personal information is not imprinted on the blockchain, obviously, but chain surveillance companies can buy this information, your personal KYC information, plus the combined Bitcoin withdrawal address. They can buy this information from the exchange and then use it to follow you around on chain. And they can follow you a couple hops or many hops, depending on the behavior. And again, it's a, it's a game of probabilities. It's not a pure science but it is possible to follow some things on chain. This isn't foolproof. It can be ineffective or effective in many cases. Some exchanges like Coinbase even run their own chain surveillance and then sell this data to governments or anyone else who wants to buy it. Selling out your customers is a great way to make a fortune as Coinbase founder and CEO Brian Armstrong knows well with his $133 million house in LA. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel. Your support really does help to spread this message and helps me with the YouTube algorithm. So please hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. It really does work and help. Hit the like button, leave a comment, suggestion, question for a future video. Also share this video with a friend or family member. So Snowden is correct and certainly not the first to point out that Bitcoin's privacy 
is not ideal. That's because every engineering solution in the real world comes with trade-offs, and Bitcoin is no different in this area. In your imaginary world, there's probably a coin that's perfectly private, scales easily to 8 billion people, has a credible fixed monetary supply, can do a million transactions per second, etc., etc. In the real world of adults, though, building real things, there are always trade-offs that include things like decentralization, speed, security, the so-called blockchain trilemma. Also includes things like credible monetary policy and maximum supply, immaculate conception, the origin of the money. These things are very, very important as well to make sure there's no pre-mine or any insider dealing from the outset because that makes it much less neutral money. So when it comes to these engineering trade-offs, it's impossible to eat your cake and have it too, though that never stops scammers from promoting their new coins that are supposedly quote unquote better than Bitcoin or quote unquote more advanced tech or quote unquote more private than Bitcoin. Bitcoin remains the most successful monetary solution that humanity has come up with so far. In fact, it's our only hope at this point in history and deep and late in the long-term debt cycle and the ending of the fourth turning. It really is our only hope. Bitcoin has transparency at the base layer rather than obscurity. This is how Satoshi constructed it. This is wonderful when it comes to auditing the supply and protecting against inflation bugs or other similar kinds of scams, but it's not ideal when it comes to privacy guarantees. Now, unfortunately, privacy coins like Monero, you could add Zcash, are not a solution either. They introduce a whole host of problems that I cover in these two videos, which I'll link to below, Monero's big fat problem. In this video, I discuss Monero's growing issues with blockchain bloat caused by ring signatures and other privacy features, as well as its vulnerability to an attack by a hired army of CPUs. By contrast, Bitcoin seeks to keep the blockchain as small as possible, so that's one video. Also, Monero's hot potato money. In this, I discuss the implications of a constantly declining exchange rate between Monero and Bitcoin. If people don't want to hodl your coin, a circular economy can never develop around it. Even if your coin supports very private transactions, the need to move into a different currency like Bitcoin in order to preserve your purchasing power negates much of this privacy. Money is a winner-take-all game. Bitcoin has already won this game. So I'll link both those videos below so that you can watch them. Now, even assuming that it was a good idea to add privacy features at the base layer to Bitcoin, actually creating the consensus necessary to add these privacy features would not solve the problem in itself and would be very difficult on its own. Even if we added some cryptographic privacy features to Bitcoin that Monero uses, like ring signatures, confidential transactions, things like this, you'd still have the problem of anonymity sets. That's because if most people are using non-confidential transactions on Bitcoin and only a few are using and only a few are choosing to use confidential transactions after this upgrade or soft fork, there's not enough, there's not a big enough crowd for the privacy folks to hide in. So that's the anonymity set problem. Unfortunately, most people have never cared about privacy and will never care about privacy. So even if you did a soft fork like this with Bitcoin, and even if there was community willingness to do something like this, which there's not, unless you could also persuade people to move their holdings from these private from these non from these less private addresses to more private addresses after the upgrade you'd run into this problem and the suggestion here is that not a lot of people would move over because most people never care about privacy and never will care about privacy i only began to care about privacy after i became a bitcoiner and after building a stash of completely kyc bitcoin unfortunately and that's the path that most people will take at this point i believe that privacy will come to bitcoin in different ways and using higher layers. Money always scales in layers and adding privacy at higher layers is one way to do this. For example, we already have confidential transactions on the Liquid Network, which is a side chain of Bitcoin. It's a federated model and it runs using something called LBTC, which you can peg into and out of by locking up real Bitcoin on the base layer on the uh, on-chain. So we have confidential transactions for the Liquid Network. This comes with its own federated custodial risks. Again, they're always trade-offs, but we can see here an example of a confidential transaction taking place on Liquid. Again, this is Bitcoin that is being sent, or LBTC, which is basically Bitcoin that trades on the Liquid Network. But there's no duplication of the supply because you need to lock up BTC on the base layer in order to use BTC on the Liquid network. So here's an example of a technology that exists. People aren't using it that much because they don't really care about privacy, unfortunately. 
Then there's a Lightning Network, another layer two. It's much more difficult to track transactions that take place on the Lightning Network since there's no global blockchain that records everything and stores it forever for anyone to view. Instead, with the Lightning Network, you have a series of interconnected payment channels that are not even all connected to each other. You have more hubs and spokes, and then you have parts of the Lightning Network that haven't even been mapped yet, and thus are not fully mappable because they don't all connect to every other part of the network. Privacy on Lightning is a complex topic that probably deserves a video of its own, but in short, my understanding is that you have good privacy as a sender on the Lightning Network, especially if you're using a self-custodial wallet but less privacy as a receiver. Now, of course, as a sender, the merchant, if you're sending money to buy something, the merchant will often know who you are because you might provide your name or at least your shipping address if you're ordering a physical product, unless you're using a third-party mailbox, which could also be a good idea. The good news is that each Lightning node on the network can only see where the SATs are coming from and where they're going. And it doesn't usually know where the SATs originated or their final destination. And that's how money moves across the Lightning Network from channel to channel to channel. Now, Fediments are another privacy tool. And inside of a Fediment, Chami and eCash transactions that are backed by Bitcoin take place, where even the guardians of the Fediment don't know how much money is being held or sent by members of the Fediment. Now, people and governments have been monitoring the Bitcoin blockchain and analyzing its content since the very beginning. In his keynote at Bitcoin 2024, Snowden pointed out in that keynote speech that AI has now entered this game. This is true, but of course, AI has entered the game everywhere now. So this isn't just Bitcoin's problem. AI is eating and analyzing all of the world's data as we speak, not just Bitcoin data. So we don't live in a perfect world. The real question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to try to hide in the tiny anonymity set of Monero and watch your purchasing power drain away against Bitcoin as it has been doing for years and years and years? Are you going to keep using US dollars online, keep using fiat, which are even more surveilled? Earning and spending physical cash is still great if you can make it work, but governments hate physical cash and will do everything they can in the future to continue to phase it out. So we're left really just with Bitcoin and Bitcoin is this trillion dollar system that actually works. It's not just in someone's head, it actually is being used by people all over the world every day. It's the only real solution out there in a sea of fiat and crypto scams. And as more and more people begin to use Bitcoin and learn how to use it in a more private way, and as the layer two tech develops, Bitcoin's privacy will increase over time. So before you worry about Bitcoin privacy too much, I'd suggest you start by taking care of the low hanging privacy fruit elsewhere in your life. So for example, throw out your Amazon Echo and Alexa devices, disable Siri on your Apple devices, disable Google Assistant everywhere, stop taking your phone everywhere with you, don't let your phone listen to or watch everything that happens at the dining room table or in the bedroom or in the bathroom and start to add a little more privacy tech to your life. You can start using ProtonMail, which now offers, I believe, a Bitcoin wallet as well. You can use different browsers from the Chrome browser I'm using right now. You can check out the Brave browser, Firefox, and then of course there's Tor, which is a little bit slower, but definitely better protection against tracking and surveillance. You can, sub you can start using Signal a bit as a messenger to friends and family members so that the big tech companies don't see every single thing you're doing online. You can also view my mirrored sites on Odyssey, for example, and on Nostra. I'll link to this video about unstoppable money and free speech and Nostra as well as I'll link to the primal version of my Nostra with my NPUB, my Nostra public key. So you can follow me there if I'm ever deplatformed here. So in general, the idea in addition to working on Bitcoin privacy is to stop feeding your privacy and your personal information to the big tech monster. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good though. Just try to use a little less big tech every day. And I know it's ironic, as I said, to hear me say this on YouTube while I'm using a Chrome browser, but this is where the people hang out who need to hear this. So spend more of your life offline where you can have real privacy. Just put away that phone and interact with the real world. Hang out with real people, maybe in more rural environments, away from the surveillance that comes with big cities and towns. And once you've incorporated some of these privacy upgrades to your life, trying to feed big tech a little less of your data, you can start to add in some of the more advanced Bitcoin skills that I can't and don't cover here on this channel for obvious reasons. Things like non-KYC Bitcoin, CoinJoin, how to borrow against your Bitcoin and certain things that have led to bad events on this platform when covered. So you have 
the paid course here where I talk about how to buy Bitcoin anonymously. And then you have the monthly live classes that I do as well as the live class recordings, as well as the Bitcoin forum on my site where we've been having some very interesting discussions. So if you want to gain access to this, I'll put a link in the description notes below as well as into the pinned comments. You can check out the paid material. First watch the 99% of my material, which is completely free. And then when you're ready to go deeper down the rabbit hole and learn some more advanced strategies and techniques, be sure to check out the paid material on my site. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.